Yeah, thank you everyone for joining us for today's webinar, where we will discuss how to create and optimize a data analysis pipeline uh, using Cytobank. My name is Hannah Polakowski. I am the program manager for our scientific consulting services at Cytobank. The agenda for today's webinar is I will provide a brief introduction to the Cytobank platform and then introduce our guest speaker and he'll provide a field report of how he developed a data analysis pipeline. And that will be followed by a live Q&A session where we will have time to answer a few questions. So what is Cytobank? Cytobank is a cloud-based software platform that includes a suite of high dimensional analysis tools as well as structured content management pieces. And we do have an informatics consulting services team as well um, so with scientific experts who can consult with you on your specific data analysis challenges. Cytobank has several different machine learning algorithms such as the ones listed here, um, poised to help find you results. Um, this table below here lists a few different features of each algorithm that differentiate them. So for example, Citrus is going to provide result resolution at the cell population level. This tool does not have a dimensionality reduction component, but it does have significance testing. So Citrus is going to be a great tool to use if you're looking for differences in marker expression or cell population abundance between groups. The power of using these different machine learning algorithms, such as the ones found inside a bank, is that they're going to allow you to see the entire picture at once. So this uh, depiction here is a um, showing the study design for this paper that came out last year in blood by Cordasi et al. And the objective of uh, these individuals was to characterize Treg subpopulations in aplastic anemia and hopefully identify predictors of immunotherapy, uh, immunosuppressive therapy response. So. What they did in their study design is they had these aplastic anemia patients undergoing immunosuppressive therapy, and they collected peripheral blood mononuclear cells at diagnosis, and then assessed after therapy whether the individuals responded or not. And when they did this, they ended up with a cohort of responders, non-responders, as well as healthy donor individuals. Afterwards, they then used a T-cell focused mass cytometry panel to characterize the T cell compartment of these uh, samples. And then they had the tedious and arduous task of actually analyzing the data and uh, characterizing the Treg subpopulations and potentially looking for predictors of treatment response. And if they did find any predictors, they did have a testing and validation uh, set to validate any potential predictors. So spoiler alert for those of you who have not seen this work before, the authors did find a predictor of immunosuppressive therapy response. And one of the ways where they first observed this was by actually using VISNI, VISNI and Cytobank. And so what you're looking at here are three individuals from each of the different groups. So healthy donors, non-responders, and responders. And you're looking at these Disney maps are all the CD4 positive T cells. And just in the colored regions of these maps is just the T cell compartment. And when they were focusing in on the T, or sorry, the T red compartment, and when they were focusing in on the T red compartment, they noticed that there were two subregions which they called B and A, and that the abundance of these subregions differed between their different patient groups. And so they noticed that the subregion B, or subset B, was more abundant in their responder patients. And they then go on to characterize this subset and find that this Treg subpopulation had a more memory activated uh, Treg phenotype, and that the abundance of this population. Uh, before treatment was predictive of immunosuppressive therapy response in aplastic anemia patients. 
So in addition to these machine learning algorithms that are available on Cytobank, we also have a variety of other features to help, um, you know, help you with your whole analysis workflow. And so the idea is that you know, there's these raw data processing tools, different analysis tools, um, tools to help with cell sample and uh, subset characterization and the ability for uh, analysis customization. And the idea is that you can piece these tools together to develop an analysis pipeline that works uh, to meet your scientific goals and uh, your particular data type. This here is an example data analysis pipeline uh, using tools available in Cytobank. And the goal of this particular pipeline was to characterize changes in single cell data. And so today, Vinko is going to detail how he used Cytobank to develop an analysis pipeline for unbiased discovery and visualization of differential cell populations from single cell data. And what he'll talk about later is he did not use, um, in this workflow, he used flow thumb. And I'm going to briefly talk about later is that we have an API that can allow you to use tools that are not found inside of Inc. So one of the advantages of using analysis tools inside of Inc. is the power of the cloud. So when we talked about earlier that uh, paper from last year, they were looking at this very small subset, about 1% of all collected cell events. And so to really be able to detect this Treg subpopulation and subsets, they needed to collect a lot of cells from each of their samples. And they wanted to look at all of these samples holistically together um, to compare across the different groups, the healthy donor, non-responder, and responders. And so in Cytobank, this really allowed them to do this because Cytobank TC is going to allow you to look at 2 million events together per run. And because it is in the cloud, the compute is going to be about two to three times faster than your local desktop solution. And so this here is kind of a cartoon of a common study design. As you can see from this cartoon, you may have uh, treatment group A and B and collecting samples over time, but you're amassing a lot of samples very quickly, and that is desirable to be able to analyze all of these data together. Another advantage, again, um, using Disney as an example, is that the cloud's going to enable parallelization for fine-tuning parameters to kind of get better visualization and, um, you know, fine-tune your analysis. So here, um, in Cytobank, you have the ability to adjust your perplexity and iterations. And this is going to be advantageous if you are looking at a lot of different samples together. You may need to adjust your perplexity or iterations to resolve expected uh, cell populations. And so in this example, this is all of the same cells, and all that has changed is the perplexity. So um, starting from low perplexity all the way to a perplexity of 100. And when this is done, you can see that the different populations are um, a little bit more succinct and being resolved with an increase in perplexity. And because Cytobank is in the cloud, um, you know, depending on your particular data type, you can adjust these parameters and set up these different analyses all at once hit run, you'll get an email when these analyses are completed, and then you can look at these different analyses and see what are the appropriate settings for your data. Another uh, tool that Cytobank has is we have an API, and this is going to allow you easy collaboration between biologists and data scientists and allow you to do uh, an assortment of different things, such as, um, say, in that previous example, you wanted to automate setting up different uh, advanced analyses, uh, Visney. In this example, it's Citrus. You could use the API to do so. There's also the ability to use the API so you have um, data stored in an electronic notebook or clinical database, and you want to integrate that with your data inside a bank. Use the API to do so. And then, um, as I mentioned, and, and Vinko's going to talk about, you used flow sound. So there's the ability, say, there's a, there's a particular analysis tool or algorithm that really makes sense for your data type. You can use this tool. You can pull your data from Cytobank, run your analysis tool, and then push your results back into Cytobank using our API for follow-up analyses. This is a uh, list of some API support that we have for developers, so I invite you to check these out and um, 
for more information. So a summary Cytobank is going to help you support your analysis workflow for single cell data analysis, um, sample heterogeneity analysis for single cell data. We're not going to be talking about today, but you could also build an analysis pipeline in Cytobank for bulk data types as well. And we have um, some details on our blog for nanostring data, for example. Um, and then we do have an API that's going to allow you to customize your data analysis workflow. We do have software trials, training, and paid consulting services as well to help you get started. So this here is just a list of resources and contact information. I do want to mention that, um, you know, after today, if you think you need help developing a custom data analysis pipeline, please contact us at this email listed here uh, to schedule a consultation for our paid consulting services. And I'm going to show this slide at the end, but now I would like to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Vinko Toshevsky, the head of the mass cytometry facility at the University of Zurich. And today he's going to discuss how he developed an analysis pipeline to empower users at the University of Zurich to analyze and interpret results from their own data. Thank you, Hannah, for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to present uh, some of our work. Let me just quickly uh, get the screen sharing going. So uh, without further ado, um, let's just uh, see what, what the plan is for today. Um, so when the, ch when the site of, uh, came up, there was a lot of excitement about it, but there was, of course, a, a lot of challenges recognized. And uh, uh, this was no different uh, uh, here in Zurich. And of course, there are a number of solutions out there, and and there isn't really one single one that that works great for every problem out there. And so basically, it, it really makes a lot of sense uh, to share pros and cons and different solutions. And this is the idea also behind uh, behind this uh, webinar. I do want to emphasize that um, this is not. I, I haven't planned this as a tutorial on, on any of the of the uh, methods presented. And also, some uh, at some point. At some point, I'm going to be talking about some, some data analysis steps, and quite often it's going to be assumed that the data has been cited already, uh, which actually uh, sometimes will take the, uh, the greatest amount of time when it comes to data analysis. So uh, because this is titled the field report, I think it's only appropriate to start uh, with the description of the field. So this would be the field. This is an initial campus at the University of Zurich. Currently, it's the home to four cycle. Uh, three of them are with the Bodomir lab, and one is with the shared uh, uh, resource laboratory here with us. And um, basically, as a shared resource lab, um, as a shared resource lab, so we support the entire hypothetical workflow uh, based on, on mass cytometry. That means that uh, we engage with, uh, with the project design, uh, with different people's lab meetings, and, and, and actually go through. Uh, Project planning. Uh, we do host a reagent repository where we have um, a large number of antibodies, uh, but also buffers and conjugation kits. And then, of course, goes without saying, we have an instrument uh, that we need to maintain, so uh, we make the equipment running, and uh, we provide assistance when it comes to data analysis. And so today, we're going to focus on the data analysis part, and not so much on the on the base pre-processing as much on the exploratory uh, exploratory data analysis. So when we were setting up uh, this operation, the biggest perceived hurdle with our with our collaborators was data analysis, and we often got this question: you know, does one now have to become a bioinformatician to analyze type of data? And I think the, the the answer is no, not really. So if you really only need, for instance, Python or, or a high dimensional, you know, just polychromatic pulse photometry. If you need sites of to, to, to just get those few additional parameters uh, uh, to measure some, some, some feature on your cell population of interest, which I in this call, uh, case call a hypothesis-based uh, approach to the experiment, you really don't need exploratory data analysis. You are driven by our hypothesis, and you have more dimensions to, to examine, but that actually works. That said, nine out of 10 people uh, are really interested in, in this more of an exploratory approach where they want to uh, uh, work with the least amount of um, um, hypothesis, and basically they want to let data talk to them. And in that case, 
probably the tools, the way we did uh, data analysis before um, are insufficient. I also want to mention, and this is going to become relevant uh, uh, later, that when speaking about exploratory data analysis, we're really talking about an iterative process, also known as, uh, let's say, hypothesis generation, and it's iterative by design, so there's nothing bad in it, while, for instance, the confirmation, uh, hypothesis confirmation or hypothesis testing would be something that you do after a careful careful um, uh, hypothesis generation, and it's actually usually done only once. So talking about new ways begs the question, what's wrong with the old ways? And basically, this slide has, has found its place in, in pretty much any presentation on, on CYTO4 or, or computational data analysis recently, so I'm not going into great details. Uh, but basically, the idea is that if you want to really explore your data set, uh, um, looking into you know number of possible combinations, as the number of dimensions gets high, so does the uh, uh, the, the the problem, because you can't really it's not feasible to look at all the possible all the possible combinations. So if the old ways are not good, so what are the new ways? I just want to emphasize here that speaking about computational data analysis, uh, it, this is often tied to CITOS, but of course it's it's far away from truth. Some of the computational uh, 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 methodologies have been developed before CITO, but many also have been developed specifically for it. So I personally believe that, that CITO was the kind of technology that really pushed the computational data analysis into the mainstream. A lot of algorithms that actually were developed pre-CITO were later uh, also uh, approved upon so that they can, they can, they can be used uh, uh, with the biggest data set. So for instance, recently I've been reading about Archie Optimix and Flow Type actually being improved algorithmically to uh, to be able to, to run faster and, and process greater data sets. So initially, at the beginning the, uh, of, of the site of story, there was no commercial solution that could do the whole job when it comes to site of data analysis. And so um, basically, if there was no software, then an obvious thing was to uh, go to programming language itself. So we started teaching people how to use R for that purpose. And now when I say we, I really think, uh, 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 what I really mean is Felix here, uh, because he was the first one actually who started doing this um, in the facility, and I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. So why R? Uh, so by no means it's the only option out there. Um, probably each lab has its own favorite language, but I must say that a lot of content developers uh, also use R, so therefore if you're going to be the first one in, in, uh, in something, you might as well use the language in which the algorithms were developed. It has a really large user base, and it's fairly interactive, which is great when you're a beginner. Uh, because you can, you know, prototype your workflows uh, in, 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 a, in a very messy way, and so you are really happy with the performance. It is free, so it doesn't cost anything to install and start running it, and it has really amazing graphical capabilities, so you can in the end really make a big splash uh, with, your, with your results. So as we went and started doing this, um, the outcome fell short of expectations, um, because we had people excited about the problem about the data analysis, how to go about this. So they came to the workshop, uh, uh, did really, really great, and then they left, and they were not a single bit more empowered uh, to do data analysis than they were before. And the reason for this was something, it was something along these lines. So basically the hypothetical workflow was, you know, you had to read in the data, you had to transform it, normalize it. You know, I'm, I'm skipping a big part here where we tidy up the data, um, then we Maybe we wanted to reduce dimensionality, uh, uh, cluster the, the, the data set, plot, calculate summary statistics, and so on and so forth. And the reality is a lot of these things people were already comfortable with without uh, um, R in, this, in, in our case. So basically, just to get this functionality, maybe to normalize, to reduce dimensionality, cluster, and plot, we actually took away a lot of tools that they felt comfortable with. So that kind of pointed us in the right direction, realizing that we probably need to find some kind of a middle ground that would satisfy both, uh, uh, both needs. And so basically we took a step back and um, you know, we looked at the data analysis more, more conceptually and if you agree with me, um, every data analysis task uh, 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 or effort can be divided into three, ta three tasks. So you do want to kind of look at your data, you need to visualize your data set. Um, you want to partition it in some way and extract some features, so some kind of summary statistics, and then in the end you probably want to compare those features and, and find out the difference between experimental groups or treatments or, 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 or something else. Now, when it comes to manual data analysis, the visualization is usually done in, uh, uh, by using a, a series of bivariate plots, 
which is okay. The partitioning and uh, extraction of features was, uh, is usually done by, by drawing gates and um, um, defining different stats for those gates. And the feature comparison is done using spreadsheets, statistics uh, packages, or, or any other solution that, that does the job. Now, when it comes to algorithm-based data analysis, the, it appears as if there's uh, countless options out there, which is sometimes confusing for the, for the bench scientist. But in reality, you can still bin those two within those three basic tasks. So there's going to be a number of algorithms whose sole purpose is to, is to uh, visualize the data. Some of them uh, depend on the partitioning, some do not. For instance, if you want to use the spanning trees and dendrograms, you will have to partition your data beforehand. But if you want to run, for instance, Disney, as was mentioned, you don't really have to partition it beforehand. Now, when it comes to uh, uh, partitioning itself, it's quite, quite popular and common to, to do clustering. Uh, to that purpose, but I also want to remind you of, of automated gating, which sometimes uh, uh, sounds like a good tool to do the job. And then when it comes to comparing features, you don't have to uh, necessarily uh, resort to uh, complex modeling. Sometimes a good old t-test uh, uh, will, will do just fine, uh, but also there are a number of other um, algorithms, number of other algorithms out there that can be used for this purpose, and each and one of them each and every one of them has their, uh, um, you know, um, scenario where they should be used. So basically, we realized that a lot of these tools um, are available in Cytobank, and so therefore that kind of drove us uh, towards uh, towards this as a solution. And actually, initially, it was the only package with native support for Cytos data. And uh, I can say we've been with it since uh, uh, some time now, and it has a very dynamic uh, development trajectory and a lot of functionality has been added over the years. And just to give you a, a little mini conclusion ahead of the main discussion, I mean, for us, it actually turned out to be a key solution that allows us to uh, that allowed us to move forward and and actually expand our operation because we are a very small lab. And as you can imagine, we 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 like to engage people, but as we engage more people, it gets overwhelming because with two people, it's hard to support all of them. So we really needed something that allowed people to explore data on their own. So for us, it's actually the advantage of Cytobank is not only in data analysis, but also in data storage and sharing. Being a shared resource lab, you acquire the data and you just uh, uh, you upload it there in a project shared with the researcher and they can start working right away. You don't even have to send an email that the data, that the data is there. So of course, it had uh, a number of limitations considering uh, if you would compare it to a, a, a fully fledged programming language. But then again, that's not a fair comparison. And the main point was that it had a wider reach, being having a graphical user interface, uh, uh, more of our users could engage with it. And actually, with this recently developed API, so this application programming interface, this, this gap in functionality is, is really shortening, and you can get very creative in, in putting uh, together your analysis workflows. So what I'm going to present you here is, uh, uh, is a workflow that can easily be done blindly, and this is important for us because we cannot be intimately familiar with all the hypotheses of our researchers. And the key is really to change these different analysis segments together because sometimes some of these tools will be meant as standalone tools. But you really get to exploit the full power of those tools if you really chain them in a smart way. So, for instance, you do the partitioning and then you do the mathematical reduction while observing the partitioning results, and then you do the comparisons and, and so on and so forth. So, each of those steps would result in an FCS file with an additional column, so I'm going to introduce that in a second. So I'm going to be presenting some demo data. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar, um, I'm, I've just stained mouse flannel sites with uh, some 27-dimensional uh, uh, panels, so 27 antibodies. And we have two genotypes, a wild type and a rat not house mouse. The rat not house mouse will have uh, uh, PMB cells missing, uh, which is a fairly big difference, but still serves a good purpose of, of uh, uh, showing a couple of points. Now, everything starts with uh, um, uploading the the data to the cytobank. Uh, with an API, you can actually prog programmatically put that data up there, but more on that later. Then we start with some basic QC. We're going to check all the channels over time, gate out unwanted events, and even check everything goes to DNA because that's the only gate that we make. And um, actually, gating should not be taken lightly, so we make sure that the gate fits. Um, basically, plotting uh, uh, with a few simple clicks all channels versus DNA reveals also the expression profiles of all markers, so you can really see what has been expressed or what, what not. 
And at that point, we say, okay, let's let's look at our data set in, in, in its entirety. So at this point, we compute the, the, uh, the Disney map. And the question often arises how to choose the channels for that computation. So which ones are the, the good choice? So basically, uh, first to just to tell you that um, if you run Disney algorithm with a non-random feed, the, the individual runs are going to be very reproducible. So I figured no one would believe me that these two plots come from two independent runs, but this is true. So you're looking at uh, 30,000 cells uh, and the run that was done um, uh, in 1,000 iterations with a perplexity of 30 and theta of 0 0.5. So basically here, I only took the expressed targets, so 21 targets. So I disregarded everything that was zero. At that point, I said, okay, let's see the impacts of uh, including other uh, 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 targets. And basically here in this run, which is, the, again, a third run, um, here I've included an additional marker that was not expressed in this pattern. Basically, there was no impact on the looks of the, of the uh, Disney map. Then I made uh, a synthetic uh, a noise channel, basically a mimicking no expression, but kind of this time being sure that it's random because it hasn't been really acquired. Um, and that also had no impact. And then on top of that, I included yet another additional channel, again random, but this time mimicking kind of a uniform expression at around 100 euro count. And as you can appreciate from here, that you get a fifth plot and it looks exactly the same. So basically adding three additional information, irrelevant channels had no impact on the runtime and the looks of the resulting uh, Disney map, assuming that you have a non-random feed. Uh, so this was done offline in, in, in R. So with that said, uh, well, you choose the parameters, you run the Disney map. Now, one important thing is by default, the, the, the cyber bank will actually display data, uh, um, taking into account the individual file contributions. So in this case, we see a representative rack file, a representative wall type file. But the thing is, uh, the clustering and dimensionality reduction in this case, those are the procedures that are done on the uh, entire data set where all the files are put together so that the algorithm has the chance of capturing the entire phenotypical landscape that is present in a data set. So therefore, actually, if you want to interpret what the algorithm did, you better also look at the entire data set. So you look at the ensemble uh, uh, file, not to the individual contributions, because this is why I like this example. It clearly shows that these two files are different, but it becomes really hard to interpret the, 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 the different regions of the map. So basically, you, you should, you should uh, uh, concatenate those files together. So this is the first time where we take a little excursion outside of the title bank. Um, uh, we get the data uh, from the platform so that we can uh, that we can merge them together. We can concatenate them. So Cytobank actually has an offline tool for that that you can use, uh, which we also use in this case. It has this option here by default, add file number uh, um, uh, channel, which I personally propose to upload this concatenated file back into the initial experiment. And in that case, you will want to tick this uh, 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 option off. Otherwise, um, uh, the panels won't match because this, this concatenated file will have one parameter extra. So if you have done that, you get a chance to look at the entire uh, uh, data set now, so the Disney results of the entire data set. Now you can appreciate that this is a different run, so the, the, it's the same data, but it was, it was done in Cytobank. And so uh, with few clicks, you can actually get an, uh, uh, um, an overlay of each and every parameter on that map which is a, a, a start of a learning process. You start to appreciate which regions of the map. And I really urge you to think of this result as a, as a geographical map. We start learning where on this map different cell types reside. So for instance, you can see this is an NKP46 here. It really, the staining didn't work really well, but it's very much reinforced by an NK11, another NK cell marker. So it's clear that this region is NK cell. So here we have neutrophil. Um, for instance, uh, here we have T cells uh, based on CD3 staining and uh, fine, uh, nicely confirmed with the DTI beta. They, or, uh, they match almost exclusively. And then we have the CD8s and the CD4s and so on and so forth. So basically we start learning what makes our data sets, what kind of, uh, what kind of cell types. And at that point, after we looked at it, we want to kind of partition it so that we start extracting uh, uh, some, some kind of summary statistics and numbers that we can work with and, and we can compare. Now, this is, in my opinion, the single most important part of data analysis. And of course, there are many different clustering methods out there. I'll be showing an example from this very recent publication, but actually there's a lot of also older work and I wanna, wanna reference that one as well, older as in before two, uh, 2016, 
but still very relevant. It, uh, the initiative was called the flow cap, flow capometry, uh, social acceptance population amplification method. And the idea was to provide um, um, a platform for um, comparison of, of, different, of different algorithms, kind of benchmarking them and, and showing how they perform in different real life, for example. As, as far as I know, there have been four different calls, and I really kind of invite you to look at that website and, and see the amazing work they did. So coming back to this um, uh, Weber and Robinson reference, Basically, before I show you some data, I just want to share this uh, uh, notion, this, 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 this comment from one of the TED Talks I've, I've seen at some point by, by Kathy O'Neill, where she says that algorithms are not unbiased, but they just merely represent the codified bias, which uh, not going into the rest of that talk, I think it's really important to emphasize that, that, that the algorithms also have certain you know, ideas based, uh, uh, based upon they were built. And a lot of people these days have, has this, they have this feeling that algorithms show the truth. When in reality, you should really understand the underlying assumptions and, and what kind of optimal outcomes did, did the author see. And so to this end, I show you, for instance, two plots here, basically plot, plotting a runtime, which is intuitive, and an F1 score, which is um, um, a balanced score of uh, you know, false positives and false negatives, pretty much telling you how well these algorithms match a human expert. And you can see, and my point is not to single out any particular algorithm here, but you can see that for different data sets here, that different algorithms perform differently. And this is the important take home message. So they're, they're just likely gonna be uh, a best algorithm for your particular problem. So in our case, we actually decided on the FlowSum, uh, uh, which is a very fast clustering algorithm based on neural network approach. And it's, it's really, really fast, which makes um, uh, mistakes or trying different options not very time expensive. And this is exactly what we needed. It has a convenient meta clustering option where you can, um, again, opt for a range of possible meta-clustering results, which I will further uh, uh, then call different binning schemes, allowing you to explore different clustering results. Because as, as, uh, um, uh, as was recently mentioned on, on a meeting, you know, clustering is a, is a hundred year old problem and we will not solve it today. So therefore, quite often we explore a number of different possible outcomes. Uh, the clustering that I'm going to show you, the results of which I'm going to show you, is performed on measured parameters, so not on thickening uh, 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 parameters. And what you end up having is a fully compliant FCS file that has a range of new columns, each one representing a cluster ID uh, uh, under different binning schemes. And basically, we take this data and we send it back uh, uh, to Cytobank. Now, back in Cytobank, actually, the platform, the, 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 the Cytobank will do a really great job recognizing these new, these new parameters in the FCS file. Just because we gave the name cluster, uh, it's going to automatically apply a linear transform and it's going to uh, estimate the range. And it does, a, in my opinion, a really good job at it. And so what this means is that if you choose this new parameter, your data is going to be partitioned now in five discrete clusters. And basically you can now really select each individual cluster without ambiguity and explore it further. Now, of course, this would be a very tedious process if there was not for um, another short uh, uh, shortcut here. Basically, in, in a gating interface, what you can do, you can use uh, an automated tool that I believe is not yet part of the uh, front end side of bank, but you can find uh, uh, more information here. Uh, and to make a long story short, uh, you don't really have to manually draw all the gates, but there is a, a little piece of code that will do those gates for, for you basically taking you from a situation like this, where you examine 20 different clusters, to a situation like this, where you get a, a discrete gate around each and every cluster. Now, as I said, this is, in my opinion, the critical step, and at this point, you have, uh, um, you have partitioned your data set, and you can now extract features, you can, you can define different summary stats for all those clusters, and you can start um, uh, uh, working with them in that way. What you can also do is you can you can just plot those clusters back to that thickening map, and this is the key uh, that I meant before, where you where you chain a couple of uh, analysis sets together, because all the data sets already had a thickening uh, uh, map, a thickening coordinates calculated. We just appended those different binning schemes, and therefore we can map each and every binning scheme back to the initial state, really now uh, uh, understanding what each cluster uh, is. If if we don't recall from the a, a initial evaluation of the thickening map, we can always do a heat map uh, um, where you can really get a phenotypical uh, description of each and every cluster and you can start figuring out, okay, so this is a likely sheet positive cluster, so these are going to be neutrophils, 
uh, um, these two are going to be some sort of uh, uh, these, these basin C and C expression and so on and so forth. Pretty much uh, 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 you are limited by your own imagination and, and actually the requirements of the experiment. Um, I do want to uh, bring up another kind of uh, uh, approach that, that we used in this case where we use then the data on which we did sifting and with, with, on which we did uh, clustering. We use that very much expanded uh, FCS file data set and we put those uh, files into the Citrus analysis because Citrus is a very powerful platform. Uh, we like it a lot because it gives you really this is statistical power uh, kind of already built in. But the problem is, uh, um, for those of you not familiar, basically it's going to cluster the data, it's going to extract features, and then it's going to run comparison of those features, giving you the clusters that are uh, significantly different. And you can see this is easy to interpret. But what is not easy to interpret is like what's the phenotype of those of those uh, uh, clusters that are different. So if I draw your attention here, you will notice, for instance, that you know a red is a cluster that is different, and the blue is everything else. And you can appreciate here that the cluster that is different between the two groups um, it has this particular marker, same as everything else. So it becomes really hard to interpret uh, uh, what those clusters are. But if you actually fed in the data that already has this new uh, 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 coordinates calculated and has all these different cluster uh, 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 different binning schemes also written into the FCS file, what you can do is you can just take that cluster that is different and you can just overlay it back into your initial map. And sometimes you will even learn, even though this is, of course, is, is, is not given, that that very same cluster fits really, really nicely with the results of, in this case, the Floson cluster. And you can then say, oh, I, I know right away, for instance, in this case, cluster 17, I think, I know right away actually what that uh, cluster is. So pretty much we move from a situation like this where we would have to guess, I mean, in this case, it would be fairly easy to guess what is different, but sometimes it's, it's not so uh, obvious. We move to a more robust and reproducible workflow where we use a number of computational tools to uh, uh, fish out the differences in, in the data set. So to conclude this, um, Basically, in Cytobank, we found a, a solution that really scales well and is as versatile as we need it to be. And it serves the purpose of, in our case, of both storage, sharing, and the analysis of the data. For us, it was very, very important that our users can explore the data on their own, and then we engage only when they are um, maybe stuck with something or, or you know, just need a more specific advice, while all the other time they can actually click on their own and this seemed to be the key. They can just click, compare different binning schemes, run some stats, uh, 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 build those hypotheses on their own, and actually, by doing that, uh, uh, move their research uh, forward beyond the limitations of, of, the, of the core lab. So allow me to finish with a, with a short acknowledgement slide. So I would like to acknowledge um, uh, Brian Brinkman, actually, uh, for kind of inspiring me to start using my keyboard more in terms of uh, uh, data analysis. Then definitely Professor Becker and Bodenmiller for driving the scientist field in Zurich, uh, each in their own unique way. Felix, the, uh, um, the very talented backend PhD student uh, who really kicked off this programming effort um, at the facility. And the current facility team, uh, Seth Bode, a staff scientist uh, who back then engaged with, with uh, what was a single person operation really wholeheartedly and without reservation and is an, is an indispensable part of the team now. And we have also visiting scientists from time to time, and in this case, it was about Annette and Paulina, who really brought a, a fresh man, manpower in the time of need. And of course, the Department of Infrastructure at the University of Zurich uh, for being the framework within uh, which we operate. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I will hand over the microphone back to Hannah, and I guess we're going to take some uh, uh, questions uh, now. Thank you, Vinko, very much for that presentation. And then before we kind of get into answering some of these questions, I just wanted to point you all to um, this resource and contact information again, and then also mention if you have questions um, regarding Vinko's presentation today to contact him at his email here. Um, he also mentioned if you, uh, if you would like access to slides to contact him for that as well. Um, 
A few of you also wrote in asking about if this event would be recorded. We are recording it, and everyone who registered for the event will get information on and the recording link when that's available. Um, and let's see. So we're going to kick off one of the questions that was asked. This question for kind of a general sediment question was, can you define uh, the seed in Disney uh, inside a bank? So currently, no, this is not uh, a feature inside a bank, but this is something that we have um, we have talked about before, and I'm happy to, if you guys, if this would be helpful for your workflows to plus one this request. As Vinko mentioned, we take user input very seriously and are trying to continually add new functionality. Let's see, um, another question was, um, this question for Vinko, um, would you recommend using other clustering methods other than flow sum for the analysis workflow you presented today. Um, for example, have you tried other methods, um, maybe some of the methods referenced in that flow cap? Um, so I would absolutely recommend trying more than one method. I um, mean, you can already get a, a somewhat different result if, if you just, you know, sometimes you just use a different, of course, if you use a different linkage criteria, uh, you will get uh, different relationships between the clusters, but also uh, some clusters fundamentally work differently. So we are also uh, quite fond of uh, uh, phenograph, uh, and some people even feel that um, you know that clustering algorithm will, will only give real results, and everything else is kind of approximate. We worked a lot with Spade also uh, um, at the beginning. So by all means, um, explore more than one tool. This goes really well with what I mentioned earlier. There isn't really one tool perfect for every job. And um, the second part of the question was, uh, uh, can you please repeat? If you've tried any of the other uh, clustering methods, such as the ones referenced in the flow cap resource. Ah, so. Um, I must be honest and say, no, apart from uh, from uh, these three, I haven't had a great hands-on, I mean, I haven't worked hands-on with uh, those other um, algorithms. I know some of them have been tried, so maybe uh, we can talk to also, if nothing else, with Lucas and, and, and Robinson, Lucas Weber and, and Mark Robinson publication, because there they also use a number of algorithms from the flow cap challenge on, on type of data, and, and so you can kind of read about the benchmarks and the performance. So another question that came in, this one's kind of a, a general one, is are these workflows, such as the one presented by Vinko today, available inside a bank uh, for general purposes? So, you know, to answer this one kind of broadly is um, there, there are support materials on uh, actually this link here, the, our support portal that kind of detail some of the functionality that Vinko walks through today. Um, we are actually in the process of um, putting together more application examples that would walk through in, in much greater detail, step-by-step step of, um, you know, how do you create the gates? Um, how do you look at citrus clusters on Disney? Um, so please write in to the support portal um, if you have, if there is a particular workflow where you might be interested in additional detailed uh, application examples. Um, if, if I may add to this uh, before we move on to the next mm -hmm. question, um, mm -hmm. I, the great thing about me being a shared resource lab is that we have nothing to hide. Um, so basically, if you also want to, I can totally share the code that produced these results. Uh, so if you want the, the R code and maybe even the demo data that is used here, uh, just uh, uh, send me an email and I'm happy to share all of those. There's nothing secret there. Right, yeah. Um, let's see, another question was, can you provide a bit more detail on the gates that Binko created for the flow sound clusters? Um, so I can comment on this one first and then Binko might have some additional insight as well. Um, so, as Vinko mentioned, there's a way to automate this process, and if you want the tool to do that, please write into support and we can give you the PDF with uh, detailed instructions how to do that. I will mention 
of note, we are we will release an R package soon that's going to have documentation for non-R users um, to use R to automate this workflow instead. And with this package that we're going to release soon, there's going to be a little bit more flexibility in um, creating these these dates um, clusters from uh, other uh, clustering algorithms such as Flowsum. Um, so yeah, coming soon. <laughs> Um, let's see. No, okay. Let's see. Uh, someone wrote in as well. This is a question for Zinko. Um, as a core kind of shared resource lab, you mentioned collaboration and content management tools being kind of a, a great feature of Cytobank. How how do you use these tools in, in your facility? Okay. Um, so. That's a very good question because um, you know the resources are always limited, and for us, because we engage also with people outside of University of Zurich, getting access to um, internal resources like like data servers where we could you know maybe share data through this this is very uh, problematic, and and the IT people would probably hate that. So uh, what we do is um, um, basically we engage our collaborators. Uh, um, both internal and external, with the with our enterprise side of it, and we use this as a as a primary place for sharing data, uh, which means that you know the the data gets acquired on an instrument. We'll um, we're going to do the basic tree processing, and then we're going to upload that data into Cytobank. So there we have uh, our projects organized as such as projects. Uh, basically, um, I know it's a lot of people use this, but uh, it's 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 a functionality kind of giving a a group of people access to uh, to those projects, and and as soon as I upload an experiment to a particular project, every person associated with that project gets uh, notified that the data is there. So it's like really simplified things. Uh, I don't have to write an email saying your data is there, get it there. The data is is ready as soon as you have uploaded. And um, so this is pretty much how we go about this. We can also add protocols, um, also other non-FTS files there uh, for sharing instead of maybe, you know, sending it by email or, or doing the other thing. So that's kind of our scenario. Great. Uh, another question for Zinko. Um, someone wrote in, what is the most challenging component of data analysis to teach others in a course setting? And is there any kind of recommended resources uh, to help new users get started? So I assume the question is referring to um, computational data analysis. So the yeah, most yeah, most probably challenging part is is um, ah, well everything. <laughs> no, but uh, I, I I would say that it's important to emphasize that um, it's not about it's not about uh, teaching people to become programmers. I, I I think there's a large part there that just deals with you know understanding how the data is structured. Uh, what travels together with an FCS file be, uh, beyond the, uh, the, the the expression matrix to to actually teach people to think in those little steps, kind of what needs to be done with the data in order to produce a good result. You know, some of those normalization things, uh, uh, you know, this, this this kind of data massaging uh, uh, to get the data in the right format to make people think about that already makes them uh, a better analyst because they appreciate better what it takes and, and how they might go about data. Because at the end of the day, what you end up using, uh, even if you're doing your entire workflow in R, what you end up using are really, really simple procedures. You just need to be able to think in that programmatic way and apply those procedures at the right place. So I would say this mindset is the biggest challenge. Once you, once you go past that, learning those 10% tools that allow you to achieve 80% of work is easy. Like you can really, you can Google, you can, you can this, you can that, you can go to workshops. But I think the mindset is the necessary first, necessary first step. Because so far everything was clickable and a lot of things were held under the hood. And I think people just uh, stop thinking about the bigger picture and what the data really is. Okay. And another general question. Uh, someone wrote in asking, could I use other tools outside of Cytobank um, as part of an analysis workflow, such as Phenograph. Um, so I can answer this one. Um, absolutely, 
um, as, as Vinko mentioned actually in his talk, you, you want to use the tools that are most appropriate for your data. And we do have this API or application programming interface that allows you to import resulting data back into Cytobank for additional analyses and visualizations. Um, you know, so for example, you know, if you want to view a cluster that an outside algorithm found, um, like Vinko, Vinko did for FlowSum, you could do the, you know, view those on Disney in, inside a bank. Yep. Now, let's see. Um, there is one other question. Before, for Vinko, um, what has been some of the challenges for you using Citrus and, and teaching teaching new users how to use that? Um, I, I've tried. I, I'm guessing from from this question that maybe maybe this individual has tried Citrus and seen uh, had had some challenges with that. Um, you know, the statistical significance portion. Well, um, I mean, I would lie if, uh, if, if I said that um, I knew the mathematics behind each and every of those models. Um, so basically, Citrus as a package comes with uh, three models built in, so the SAM, the PAM, and the, uh, and the GLM net. And SAM, I can wrap my mind around still PAM and, and GLM net less so. But I think the important thing is that we, we well, I am not a, a content producer. I'm I, I'm I'm an integrator, so I need to know enough about the tool in order to decide when that tool is a is a is an appropriate tool for the job and when not, and in order to critically interpret uh, the data. So I don't really need to be intimately familiar with the mathematics. So I am user of those tools, and basically I think it it already helps if if someone uh, just explains a user. The, the basic ideas and, and the conceptual steps behind the analysis, and then all of a sudden also the interpretation of the data becomes more, more uh, the interpretation of the output of Citrus becomes more intuitive, and you start recognizing uh, 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 some things that you may have missed before. So just kind of getting away from this stress that you need to know the mathematics, and you don't necessarily have to, to be a good user, and just have someone explain uh, the concept behind it, so the, the steps in the analysis at the conceptual level, and I think that's already uh, 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 a lot to to actually start using it and, and start interpreting data um, that comes the results that come out of it. Mm -hmm. And I'd and also add to um, again, we have this support portal that you can write in for questions, but also it's a great place to just start. You know, typing keywords and have numerous articles on, you know, how to set up an analysis, a little bit of background on Citrus, and, you know, background on all these different, um, all these different tools inside a bank. Okay, so we're going to wrap up the live Q&A session. Um, again, just want to mention our resources and that if you have additional questions after you've um, you know, gone about your day or tomorrow, that you can uh, contact Vinko directly um, and also request his slides. And then you can contact us at Bank at our, using our support portal. Um, we do also have a YouTube channel with videos if you are an auditory learner or if you have others in your group that um, you know we have some videos on Citrus and basic Cytobank functionality. Um, and then if you are interested in working with us to develop a custom data analysis pipeline, um, please contact us at this email address here to schedule a consultation for our paid consulting services. So thank you so much, everyone, for your time and for joining us today. And um, I'm sure I'll hear from many of you later. Thank you from my side.